everyone, this is Mirko Guerrini and I welcome you to the Jazz Transcription Clinic, a monthly interviews podcast where we talk with accomplished jazz doctors about their lives, career and their personal secrets on the art of transcribing. If you want to improve your jazz, stay tuned and follow the Jazz Transcription Clinic on the socials for more content. I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which this podcast is being recorded. I pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and the Aboriginal elders of other communities who may be here today. Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of the Jazz Transcription Clinic podcast. Today I'm very honored to host a fantastic uh, musician, saxophone player, educator, composer, and you name it. His name is Jeff Schneider. You probably have uh, watched one of his videos on you know, how to get better at jazz, how to understand what we do in jazz music, and I'm very humbled to have you here, Jeff. Thanks a lot for participating in this interview. Oh, thank you for having me. Great to be here, Mirko. Uh, Jeff um, doesn't like to talk too much about himself, and I think you know that that's very uh, honorable. Um, he uh, has a very very brief bio on his website. Link uh, will be in the video description as well as links to his YouTube channel. Uh, but basically, he started uh, jazz music in his first phase of his musical journey, uh, and then got into composition and scored a lot of uh, music for uh, film and television and won several awards and then he focused on education and uh, if you are not familiar with his uh, content online is is pretty unbelievable and all his videos are super clear and very informative and I, I use those videos a lot with my students so now I can tell my students hey I met this guy online uh, <laughs> How are you there? I'm doing well, and thank you. Thank you for the, uh, for the kind words. Uh, you deserve it. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, Jeff, uh, I was uh, watching some some of your videos uh, before, and there is one video that is um, uh, not too recent on like few tips on how to transcribe so I guess we will talk about it and I will ask maybe later in the interview if you have changed your your view or, or your strategies right. but do you remember how video is do you remember how far back this one I your reference I think it goes back about seven years okay all right so yeah I'll have to, you'll have to refresh my memory on. All right. Um, but I can start with the traditionally the first question, uh, which is, uh, why do you transcribe, Jeff? Oh, it's a, that's a good first question. Um, you know, the, the analogy that I use all the time for music and that other people use, especially for jazz, is, um, is the analogy of language and music and how important it is to approach learning mu uh, music as you would learn a language. And one of the main things when it comes to learning a language is learning vocabulary. And learning vocabulary in music is just like learning vocabulary in a language. You have to learn the words and learn how to put the words together to form sentences and the sentences together to form paragraphs or, or ideas and eventually just get a message across. So if you want to speak in a certain way or speak a certain kind of language, you have to study that language. And you can get even deeper than that. You can study like a, a dialect within a language. Well, with music, the, the way to do that is through transcription, because you can learn all of the, the rules, you know, whether it be scales and arpeggios and music theory. Uh, you, you can learn all of that in a sort of an abstract way. But to really understand how it fits together to actually create something that it, that sounds like music and that conveys a message, 
you have to study the actual language. And the way that I, the, the best way I find is to, uh, is to transcribe and to um, not, not just, I, what, what I find is actually really important is to combine all of those rules and the music theory with the transcription. We can get into this a little bit more, I'm sure at some point in the conversation. Um, but that, that's why I transcribe. It's to master the language, not, yeah. not just by the rules, but to actually learn the game. I use the same analogy very often, and you have young kids, so you know how young kids, the way they learn the language is just by transcribing their parents. Exactly. And they're not thinking about uh, spelling or grammar or conjugation or anything like that. They're just, they're just learning it. Yeah. Like they're absorbing it. Yeah, and that's also sometimes a problem that we have within academies, you know, because in academy you have to structure everything to prepare an offer for the students to look at, but sometimes you put yourself in a cage uh, or you start with the wrong foot, right? So everything, in my view, everything that has to do with music uh, have to start with a sound. You have to get the sound first, and then we can talk about the rules. But even, oh, even his, yeah. yeah, even historically, I mean, the the reason why in counterpoint is a uh, like a, v a very bad crime to to write a parallel fifth, for example, is just because it's difficult to sing. You know, if you try to sing with a uh, with a friend two parallel fifths, it's super hard. So they put out the rule, oh, you don't do that. You know, it's prohibited. But that's a consequence of a sonic matter, of a sonic issue. So that's that's a big point. Exactly. Yeah. You know, the school thing is uh, is a good point. I I think that. I don't know if it's changed since I was, I went to a conservatory and, you know, did a lot of um, music programs growing up. And, you know, even, uh, I wonder if it's changed since I was, since I was studying there, because a lot of what's pushed on students is, is the music theory, is the rules. And uh, that's not even half the battle. I mean, it's, it's one way to learn it and it helps, but it's not the most important way. Yeah. Uh at least in the academies where I teach, we try to balance uh, both things. So all the students, when they prepare their technical exams, they have a bunch of scale modes, arpeggios, and chord tones, guide tones, but they are also compelled to learn and memorize four transcriptions for every exam. So we try to deliver the message that, yeah, theory is important, and uh, but, you know, the other thing is more important and is where you really learn uh, the language. I mean, that's a great way to do it. You know, one, one other thing I wanted to mention on that topic was it's, it's hard. It's really hard to absorb music in that way where it, where it just naturally sort of seeps its way into your consciousness like it would a child it's a lot easier to memorize a scale it really is it's like memorizing two plus two is four but to really absorb a language on a on a subconscious level that takes time and, and a lot of people have a hard time accepting how much time it takes to absorb material like that and it's a lot more you get a lot more of that instant gratification if you just memorize a, a lick uh, you just memorize the notes in a lick or memorize a scale or an arpeggio because that you can pick up, you know, you, you memor it's just memorization. It's yeah. not the same thing absorbing a language. Now you're right, you remind me of the words of uh, Edwin Gordon. Are you familiar with his work? No. Edwin Gordon was an American bass player that then be became uh, an educator and he developed a system that is similar to uh, like the Suzuki system, but more oriented to uh, preschool kids. So he developed this system where he teaches all you need to know as basic rules of music to kids from zero to 
six years old yeah. and he does it just verbally or sonically just by listening and singing clapping and it's amazing and i i watched an, an interview to this guy and he's saying that the reason why we teach scales and arpeggios and we write down things to students is because we make the teacher's job easier yeah <laughs> that's funny yeah Peasant to that. yeah <laughs> And I do agree because it, it's it's easier to judge someone. You ask play E flat major scale, and if you play it right, I give you a high mark. If you play it wrong, you know it's too easy. But when I have to judge your musicianship, you know it's it's very hard. It's very difficult, and so <laughs> it's a nice point of view. But. Um, Anyway, and when you uh, transcribe, Jeff, what do you expect to achieve? What is your goal, main goal, apart from what you said before, you know, learning the vocabulary? But do you have other angles that you would like to uh, elaborate? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there, I like to set different intentions when I'm practicing or transcribing. And that might be, like I was saying before, to learn vocabulary, but I might get more specific than that. It might be to learn a specific kind of vocabulary. Like maybe I want to work on my, my blues vocabulary, so I'll seek out uh, blues solos that I like. Um, it might be more related to rhythm, where I just want to, I'm not even that concerned about pitches. I just want to be absorbing a rhythmic approach that I think I, either is interesting or something I, I want to get better at and uh, need to improve upon. So I, I seek out things that I want to either improve upon or am just interested in. And it's, uh, I like to be specific now in, in what I transcribe just because it does take time and I only have so much, so much time. So uh, I, do, I, like, I do like to set an intention. I think that helps, especially with practicing in general. Just setting intentions is really powerful. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that... Um goes together with the next question which is uh how do you choose the solos that you transcribe so i guess there is are you following a specific need a specific need like uh oh i feel i need to improve my playing over coltrane changes oh, and then yeah, you sometimes. go and seek yeah sometimes it's like that where i feel like some area of my playing playing needs some help and i need to uh one one great way to to shore up that area is uh is by transcribing um a, a lot of the you know just to be to be honest a lot of the times though i'm just like really into i might hear somebody play a, a cool line in a solo and just want to figure that out i mean there's um you, you were talking before about requiring students to transcribe as part of the the uh, curriculum and I know some other schools do that. And a lot of the times those solos will be assigned. Like there, there will be like uh, required solos. Everybody has to transcribe, uh, which can be which can be valuable. But I find that the stuff that, it, you know, one of the one of the main reasons I transcribe is to learn new vocabulary. And I find that that process of absorbing the vocabulary to the point where it becomes subconscious and I can just play it without having to think about it, that process is sped up considerably if I'm transcribing material that I really, really love as opposed to something that's just assigned to me. Now, that doesn't mean there's no value in transcribing something that is just good to know. Like, I, you know, uh, I, I don't remember if. I don't think I was ever required to transcribe a specific solo, but I remember people saying like, oh, everybody has to transcribe like, uh, you know, Sonny Stitt solo mm -hmm. on Eternal Triangle because it's got so much great rhythm changes vocabulary. And I never really transcribed that entire solo. I, you know, picked up some licks here and there. But uh, the solos that have stuck with me over the years and what I think has really developed my vocabulary and helped me find my sound, I've done that by transcribing recordings that I really love. That stuff is the stuff that sticks with you. And it makes sense, right? You're gonna, you're gonna spend the most time focusing on stuff that you really enjoy listening to. So that's how I choose my solos these days. Or you know, to, to, to tell you the truth, I'm not really transcribing full solos nowadays. I'm usually just picking out you know, 
uh, a passage here and there that I can't figure out um, on the spot and need to dig into a little bit further. And yeah. it's just because I like it so much and I want to know what's happening there. Yeah, but we go right back into the loophole of, you know, the academy needs to have a, a somehow a system that is fair for everyone. So you have to have the students preparing the same stuff so you can mark them in a fair way. And I get your point and I don't think there is an easy solution for that because if we let the students, you know, choose their the solo they want to transcribe, then it becomes almost impossible to have a fair marking process because someone might choose a solo that is really easy and another one you know what I mean. So the unfortunately because i i get your point and i'm with you uh but uh that's not entirely possible when you have a structured you know course and I, don't think, I don't think it should be i think it should be a little bit of both because yeah. like i said there is value in learning you know old solos that might not be you know contemporary sounding but the other thing that i find really interesting is that when you transcribe something uh, you you really get a deep inside look at the at the music that you wouldn't be able to perceive if you were just listening casually. And what often happens is, you know, I, I've I've trans transcribed recordings and have heard things that I didn't hear before. Yeah, because I'm listening on such a deeper level. So what can happen is if you're transcribing something that might not be your first choice, say it's like a an old like. A, I don't, I don't know, just an old solo that, you know, you're like, this is, you know, not hip anymore. Well, you take a real close listen to it and then you realize, oh, wow, I wasn't listening closely enough because there is some really hip stuff in the solo, whether it be the phrasing yeah. or the rhythm or the pitches. And that can just go over your head if you don't spend the time focusing in on it. Yeah. So I think you have to do both. Transcribe we, what you love, but also transcribe what's, eat your vegetables, too, you know. <laughs> we actually offer um, the option here to... There is a, a solo that the student can choose between like three or four options. Okay, that's cool. Like I can't remember whether it's first year or second year, they have the option of transcribing stolen moments and they can transcribe either Freddie Hubbard, Oliver Nelson or Bill Evans, right? So at least you, you are sending the message that guys, this is a great track and yeah. there is great content in this track, you know, created from YouTubers <laughs> 60 years ago. <laughs> uh, and pick your preference, you know, so. That's good, that's a nice balance. Yeah, um, that's good, that's good. And the reason why I ask this question is because this is, uh, a very common question within students that are starting learning jazz and I'm pretty sure that you will get this question a lot you know what solo should should I transcribe and usually my first response is you need to transcribe something that you like that you really like and you can't be bothered in listening 200 times um, because that, that that is what is going to happen you know, it's going to be stuck in your head for <laughs> like a few weeks. And and okay. then my other suggestion is that you need to pick something that is uh, doable at yeah. your level for your skills, because it's too easy to get overwhelmed and to start thinking, oh, I'm not good at it. I will never learn it. And they start looking at people like you, Jeff, like uh, Martians right uh, people that are doing stuff and i can hear i'm not good enough so it, it's hard to find a balance but sometimes you know we can at least direct the students into something that they can start seeing the benefits and start feeling that they are improving because they might i remember my first solo it took me a month to transcribe it, and then i went to my teacher and it was 80 percent wrong but it was a starting point and I started there and I improved a little bit and I had a great teacher uh, 
so that that's another important factor that sometimes at least not for me but if i have to suggest uh, a student those are the, my main points yeah that's such an important part as a teacher is is to suggest solos that are doable but are still in line with the student's uh interests yeah you know is there it's it's sure it's easy to find a great record and a great solo but it might not be the right level i mean it probably isn't especially if somebody's just getting into improvising or transcribing like you would going back to language you, you would never put like a uh an adult nonfiction book in front of a six-year-old who's just learning to read yeah right? that that's that's silly when you think about it but a lot of people who are just getting into improvising will you know pull out like a chris potter recording and be like i'm gonna learn this and it's you know it's not it's not going to do you as much good as finding a solo that is still really hip and in line with your interests but is much more doable than jumping way down you know way ahead of where you should be uh spending your time yeah you're right you're right that's a key job to suggest uh appropriate solos and the problem i i found out and i have is that when you play and when a jazz player plays in a recording or in a live concert never thinks in an educational way right so to me that's the reason why it's difficult sometimes to find a good educational solo to start with uh, and i know that a lot of people use this for example miles davis kind of blue uh, so what solo you know because it's very linear very logical um, but um it would be great to have i i thought about it about creating some content where i play very simple solos for beginner transcribers mm -hmm. but then i realized that what i would play wouldn't have the same didactical uh, value as you know if i play a track because i want to play that track and i don't like, think i have to play simple. simple i have to play neatly i have to play correctly you know, which is an awful word in jazz. <laughs> um, so it, it's difficult to find the balance there, but, uh, you know, we can... Uh, you know, one, one, one other thing that can help is to not be so strict with the transcription, meaning if there's a part that is just way too hard, I think, I think it's fine to skip it. You know, maybe come yeah. back to it when you're feeling, you know, like you're able to tackle something that is, you know, a whole bunch of 16th notes at, you know, 200 beats per minute it's i would just skip that part I, a lot of people get hung up on the you know oh i got to get every single note and i can't go on to the next thing until i get this all worked out and that's not a great way to transcribe a solo i think you have to a lot of the times i'm working backwards too you know i'll, I'll uh, have trouble hearing something so i'll skip a few notes and then suddenly i have the sort of like the target worked out and now it's a lot easier to hear that approach to that target yeah. So you got to skip around. I think that helps a lot. And if there's a part that's just way, uh, way too difficult, I am all for just skipping over that and coming back to it so you can get more out of that solo. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. I, I had a student when I was back in Italy, uh, probably even 20 years ago, I had a wonderful guy, young guy. He was like 16 when... He started coming to see me and his father had a wonderful collection of vinyls from 1920 to 1960 you know nothing after that so the guy started transcribing like uh johnny hodges or uh, sonny state and i remember he was doing exactly that he was memorizing all the parts that he could play and then he was waiting when the path was becoming too difficult and start again when, you know, like it was becoming doable for him again. And it was fantastic because he had uh, anything, you know, any issue with that, with doing that. And he was just waiting for a later time when he could do that. And 
that was the right approach. So let's dive into the next question, which uh, will be very interesting, which is what is your methodology? And uh, I saw a video on your YouTube channel where you talk about how you do transcribe. Although the video is uh, uh, a bit old, I would say, I think it's seven years uh, back and I didn't find, I didn't look into all your videos, but I don't think you have another video where you talk about uh, your methodology of transcribing. So it would be interesting to ask you whether you still use the same methodology or if you have changed your mind, if you do it things differently. I think you mentioned four main points. Okay. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Name all four. All right. Um, I have a feeling one of them was sing. Yes. Um, so the first one was listening to the track. Okay. Sense, yeah. Listening a lot of times, many times. Second one was to sing. And third one was to uh, get the notes on the instrument. And fourth one was to transpose some of the lines. So you start processing the language into your playing, which, yeah. by the way, is one of the questions in, in this podcast. So we can maybe talk about it later. Sure. Well, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because uh, that video up, I think I don't think it's I don't think my method has changed, but I've, I've added some steps or I'd like to emphasize some important points that I probably didn't dig into as much in that video from way back when. So obviously listening is still important. You can't figure it out until you listen. Um, and singing is really important, too. There's also the I, I think it's also important to make sure that when you're singing the notes, of course, you want to get the pitches as close as you can. And I don't really care about tone quality of, you know, we're not all vocalists, but um, intonation is really important, right? You want to be singing the pitches as, as accurately as possible. Um, but you also want to be aware of the time. And I don't know if I made that as, uh, I don't think I emphasized that enough because you can sing and, you, and you, can, you can sing along with the track and you can even sing without the track and still not have a real good sense of where the pulse is. So I think singing along with some sort of like timekeeping, whether it's just snapping on two and four or whatever, uh, just so that there is some awareness of the pulse of the tempo. That's, that's a really important part. So that's what I would add to the singing portion. Um, I would also say that sometimes you're not going to be able to sing everything perfectly until you go through the other other steps, like playing through and even transposing. Like those steps will help clarify the sounds of the pitches in your ear. So again, we were talking about skipping around within a solo that might have difficult sections. Well, with this, this process, I think the singing part is actually the hardest because to, I mean, the truth is if you can sing it with really accurate pitches, figuring out the notes is not that difficult because you have such a clear, like aural picture, if you will, of what the uh, solo is and what, the, and, and what those notes are. And then it's just a matter of finding them on your instrument. Um, what yep. else? Yeah, what's that? No, I, I think I think you're absolutely right. And uh, sometimes, you know, singing helps us, especially as saxophone players, to connect the sound in our brain and not use our fingers. Because sometimes we can fall into the trap that this finger we use to play the note B on the saxophone, which is a lie anyway, because depending on which saxophone you are playing, it's not a B. Uh, and so that's the problem we have when we read music that we can play mechanically. So if I may suggest to add an extra step to your <laughs> methodology, and I don't want to sound arrogant, Jeff, just no, I'm, I'm sort of working it out on the spot here. So please uh, help me out here. Uh, what I like to do is first to learn to sing the solo. And, and then I start, once I figure out the note, uh, I start 
singing and moving my fingers in the air accordingly. Yeah. So I create a connection, a muscle memory in my fingers that start with the actual sound of it. So do bo do ba bo do ba do be da do ba do bo da bo do bo do ba da bo da bo do bo do do bo. And if I do that, I don't care what the node names are, you know. But I just hear the sound and moving, playing the air saxophone. This is what I called, helps me to get away with the idea that. Each note has a name, and each value has a name. I'm playing a quaver, a dotted crotchet here, an accent, a marcato. That is in the book, but I'm not interested in this phase, at least. And yeah. and so that has me to, you know, create some sound coming out from my fingers, so that this finger is do do is no more a B or whatever. It's just do a sound. And if I need that sound, I know where where it is in my hands. Interesting. Yeah. Well, you know, I would I, I'm kind of on the same page as that. I would what I would say is maybe maybe this would be sort of the step after that would be to once you do start figuring out the pitches, the note names themselves, is to ideally do that without your instrument and use your ears. And then you can go back to playing air saxophone or even to fingering the notes on your horn without playing them. And you can map out the entire solo without playing a note on your instrument and actually know what the notes are. Now that takes a lot more time and it can be frustrating because of how much effort it does take to go through that. But that's real ear training there. You're not, a lot of the times people will just hunt for the note on their instrument until they find it. And that is not helping you. It's just not helping you. Really the transcribing should be done in your head, not on your instrument, yeah. which is why singing is so, so helpful and important because if you sing the pitches accurately, that process of figuring out what note it is, is so much easier. You can't, I mean, it's not even easier. You just, you won't be able to do it until you have a clear image of something. It's like if you're trying to, let's use an analogy here. I love analogies and they don't always work, but I think this one's gonna work. So you, 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 uh, you see a picture of somebody, but the image is, is blurry. I mean, you can tell it's a face, right? You know, it's a person, but you don't know who it is because it's, it's a blurry image. Well, if the picture's in focus, then you say, oh, it's Mirko, I can, t I can see who it is now. A lot of the times people will be hearing notes from their solos that they're trying to transcribe as if it's a blurry picture and they won't have a, a real clear, accurate idea of what that note is. They don't have a center to the note. So if you're singing with good intonation, then you're fine. Then you're you're putting that picture into focus and then you can say, oh, it's Mirko or, oh, if we're using music, it's an A or a B flat or whatever the case may be. So you have to have a real clear idea, a real clear uh, aural um, idea of each individual note, because if you are just trying to hunt for that note on your instrument, you're not get you're not doing yourself any favors. It's not helping your uh, your ear training, and it's not going to make transcribing easier the next time. Yeah, um, it's, uh, that's unfortunate because it's hard work to train. It takes a lot of time. You might as well, you know, put in the work so that the next time you transcribe, it's easier because your ears are a lot stronger. I think I mentioned this uh, earlier in, in passing, but I just want to bring it up one more time. Um, when I'm transcribing now, often it's because I can't figure it out um, right off the bat. Like I, th there's a lot of, you know, if I listen to like a Charlie P Parker solo, for instance, and I've, I've played so many bebop solos and transcribed so many uh, of his solos and read so many solos out of the Omni book that most of what he plays, I can play it back without having to work it out because I'm just so familiar with the language. Yeah. But if I listen to somebody that I'm not as familiar with, I have to go through that process of hearing the note clearly, figuring out how that note relates to the chord or the key. And that's going to bring you back to that methodology we were talking about. I think another important step is to make sure you have an awareness, not just of the high level pitches, but the harmony on which the pitches sit. Because if it's it, it, the same as with time, we were talking about keeping the time. Yeah, you need to have that that bed underneath the stuff that's on top, 
I'm, you know, for anybody that's just listening, I'm doing some, you know, wild and crazy hand motions here. <laughs> that's hopefully uh, helping explain what I'm talking about here. But if you don't have an awareness of the harmony or the key center or the chords, then these notes that are that are on top of all of that are sort of like lost souls in the abyss. So you have to know where the time is. You have to know where the key center is and where the chord is within that key center. And then you have this sort of contextual landscape where these notes can exist. And that makes a huge difference. And I, I, just, I just, you know, went on a rant there, but hopefully some of that made sense because I do think those points are really important to know where the time is and know where the harmony is. Absolutely, absolutely. And do you write it down? When you, when you transcribe or you simply memorize and leave it there? Um, it depends. I have written solos down. What I usually try to do is learn it without writing it down. And then when I've learned the solo and can play it back, then I write it down. And it's a little bit, it can be easier to do some analysis. Also writing it down helps, really helps clarify rhythm, I find. Um, it makes you really think about the rhythm in a way that you you know, we were talking before about you don't even realize what's happening until you listen that deeply. Well, when you write things down, you have to be extremely accurate with with your rhythm. You know, a pitch is, uh, you know, for the most part, there are 12 notes, right? Well, with rhythm, there are, are I guess, it, there are really infinite um, ways of playing those notes within the, the grid or even not on the grid, just sort of off it and in different ways. So I do like to write it down for uh, for some solos, especially when it comes to understanding what's happening. Yeah, later. this is a a big point for me, you know, uh, talking about transcription and try to dive deep into this concept is that when we write music down, we use what I call a three steps compromise. So the first compromise is what I hear and how I can transfer to the paper. And that's already a big compromise, especially for jazz music. You know, uh, how can you write uh, down a Dexter Gord online and being 100% precise? You cannot. Right. It's impossible. Right. You have to compromise. You have to use... Uh, you have to try to get closer to that idea, but you will never be right there. And uh, the second compromise is the person that is going to read my transcription and the person that is going to play, the third compromise is how the person will play yeah and sometimes the result can go really far away but i use it as a like a double check double checking process so i write a line i transcribe a line i write it down and then i ask one of my friend with a good you know reading to play that line if what i hear is close enough to what i have transcribed I think I've done a good job, but sometimes, you know, I think I've done a good job and I play and it's wrong. Maybe I just use too, a too big compromise or I wasn't too accurate with no durations, for example, at the end of a phrase or a line. You know, sometimes we hear a long note and we say, okay, let's write a meaning, but then a guy is going to play and plays ba, but no, the player in the recording plays ba, and it's different. Yeah. So I found that very interesting because uh, as educators, we we also need to find ways to, you know, handle out some of the things that we do, and yeah. and so that all compromise when we write down music is is haunting me. <laughs> But you can get so crazy with that stuff. Like you can write down solos and put all of the phrasing markings in there, all of the slurs and the articulations and the dynamics. And, you know, it's going to be at a certain point impossible to read because there's just so much information. And as a reader, it's just you can only take in so much. And I'm also I was mentioning the Omnibook, the Charlie Parker Omnibook, 
earlier and there's nothing in there it's just the notes yeah i mean even the chord symbols are bare bones it's like yeah. i don't even think they have like major sevens written in it's just like g yeah and it's an implying a major seven chord so at the end of the day at least for me when i'm writing stuff down sometimes it's for rhythmic clarification um but a lot of the times it's just so i don't forget like it's it's a it's a cue that helps me remember especially for a long solo can be really helpful to uh to have that there just so it, it makes it a little bit easier to remember obviously um and then the other the other thing was i think i mentioned this but writing things down can uh especially for beginner improvisers it helps to see the relationship between the notes and the chords and and that's an important part because after we were talking about the process right and singing and uh playing and and then writing things down well analyzing the solo is really important because that's how you're gonna that's good that's what's gonna help you with the transposition step which is at the end of that method that i uh talked about yeah uh, and and having an idea of how the notes fit with the chords makes transpo transposing much easier and it's also just going to make you understand what uh the soloist was thinking about uh when when uh when they yeah. were soloing yeah and that would be definitely the probably the next question um here that is uh <clears throat> how do you practice transcriptions or even how do you incorporate ideas into your playing ideas that you got from you know your transcribing process or just a line do you have like any methodology or you simply wait for it to happen yeah well you can wait for it to happen but i like to you know as a teacher especially my i feel my job is to speed up the process for my students as much as i can so that they can get to their uh to the, they can reach their goals and get to the next level as quickly as possible so there are there's sort of like three things um Well, let me start with two that come come to mind. So there's there's the pitches involved with a solo. And we talked about singing and, and how important that is. Transcribing the pitches or transposing the pitches rather, it really helps speed up the process of internalizing the sound of the of the line. It, it's something to do with just hearing it in different keys and then really really having a deep uh, grasp of the of the theory you know when you're analyzing a, uh, a solo and you see that there's an arpeggio of the uh, like a major seven arpeggio or let's make it even a little a little bit more complex let's say it's a an arpeggio from the the three up to the nine on a major seven chord so like c major sevens and the notes are e g b d well if you're transposing that into all 12 keys you're going to be constantly thinking three five seven nine arpeggioing up from the three to the nine and You're re every time you transpose, you're reinforcing that the, the theory there. So it's like, and I mean, there's just so much good stuff that comes out of transposing from the ear side to the theory side. It helps you focus. It forces you to focus. Uh, it helps you learn your scales and your chords because you're going to be working through scales and chords that you're not as uh, used to or comfortable with. So there's a, a tremendous amount of value. Um, The other way that I practice transcribing or the transcribed solos is by taking like one phrase at a time. You know, you, you got to do a, a limited amount for this. And the idea is to record yourself playing that phrase and trying to make it sound as close to the original recording as possible. Yeah. And this is as difficult as if you were to take, you know, four seconds of this podcast of me talking or of you talking and to try to sound exactly like me talking or exactly like you talking if you listen if you know if you go to like uh impersonators on youtube or on yeah. snl or something and you hear people do those impressions they're extremely talented the people who can do that and it's extremely difficult anybody who's ever tried to impersonate an actor or even a friend or a family member knows how difficult it is to make your voice sound like another person's voice And when you're doing that with music, it's the same thing. So you have to take a small amount of material and work it out that way. So I record myself, try to match the recording, listen back, compare and contrast. Okay, I gotta scoop a little bit more here. I gotta add a little vibrato there, increase my dynamic there. 
and then just rinse and repeat as many times as you can. And then you're going to eventually get pretty close. It's never going to be exact, but that process of going over again and again will help you absorb the phrasing of the, uh, okay. of the soloist. Which okay, is, uh, good. Out, out. Just a curiosity. Have you ever transcribed yourself? I think I might have. I don't, I haven't done it recently and I don't think I've done it a lot, but, um, I think just as an experiment, I transcribed yeah. all of mine at one point. I'm too scared. <laughs> <laughs> I've never done it. I should because uh, I also got a question on, on my channel uh, that you, you should transcribe yourself. But <laughs> I'm really, you know, too scared to suddenly realize how bad is my applying. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. I have a hard enough time just listening to myself, let alone transcribing yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but I, will, I, I uh, get the idea that it would be very beneficial because then you uh, you can go very surgically, you know, to intervene into some areas that need a bit more work. But yeah, as I said, it can be really overwhelming. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I can think of... Um... Well, there's one one side of me thinks. Well, if you're improvising, if if you're improvising lines that you're truly hearing in your head, then you shouldn't really need to transcribe yourself. Just like when I was talking about Charlie Parker, I've transcribed so many Charlie Parker solos. I've played so many omnibook solos that I don't need to transcribe a Charlie Parker lick now because as soon as he plays it, I'm like, I know what that is. Yeah, you know, for the, with, with some exceptions, but you know, I'm very familiar with the vocabulary. So when you're improvising, you're listening back to your own solos. Well, like I said, if you're really hearing what you're playing, then you've already you've already done the transcription in a way. Like when you're improvising and you hear something in your head and then you play it, well, essentially what you're doing there is hearing something in your head, transcribing that sound into notes and then playing it on your instrument. It's just happening extremely fast. Yeah. Now there is uh I do I do think there well, of course there are times when we screw up and we make mistakes, whether it might be, uh, maybe, you know, let's, here's a real common example, something that I fall into a, a bunch. I'm playing and, you know, I'll play something that's like, I screw myself up. Like I'll try to do some sort of rhythm thing and suddenly I'm kind of losing the time a little bit or I, I lose the form. And I think it can be helpful to listen back and, and transcribe to figure out where things went wrong. And, and then you can avoid the, uh, the mistake or hopefully try to avoid the mistake next time. Oftentimes mistakes happen because of uh, almost like an invisible cause that you have to find. And the cause is often before the mistake ever happens. It's like if you're in a car, you know, the, the, the accident is when you hit the tree. But what caused the accident was when you took the turn too fast. And a lot of the times we focus too much on hitting the tree and not realizing, oh, the real issue is when you tried to take that turn too fast. So you, gotta, you have to look back to see what went wrong and transcribing can help with that. That that's great advice. I I will I will try that way. It sounds it sounds a bit more, you know, focus on something else rather than just my applying and I think I can cope with that. <laughs> I will try that. Um now uh Jeff, um we are heading towards the end and I always save the two silly questions for the end of the episode so please take it as a game more than a serious question but uh, I'm interested who was the most difficult player that you transcribed uh, I don't know I don't think that that's silly it doesn't sound like a silly question to me oh maybe the next one will be sillier promise right. well, I'll say that I don't think I, I can't think of a, a specific uh, solo, but what I will say is that I find that the hardest solos for me to transcribe are not actually not necessarily the solo itself, but what's happening around the solo. So especially when I'm transcribing more modern music and you know the rhythm sections are playing a lot with the with the the meter and superimposing lots of chords and and um, and playing over the bar line, all, all sorts of rhythmic craziness. That can make it really difficult to figure out what is happening in the solo, even if the solo is pretty simple. So I find that to be the most challenging stuff to t transcribe these days is, 
it's not necessarily obviously if somebody's just burning over you know a tune and shredding 30 second notes that's going to be challenging but you know you can slow some stuff down and uh, i'm not opposed to slowing things down and, and figuring it out that way but when things are happening in the in the rhythm section that are complex that can really throw me off so uh that's where i have to work on that's where that's where i'm working these days yeah. I remember a while ago on on my podcast, I transcribed um, the cost of living in the Michael Brecker's album, and I transcribed the melody. I transcribed Charlie Hayden solo and Michael Brecker's solo, and I have to tell you, you know, Michael is fantastic, of course, a lot of notes, and but as a saxophone player, it wasn't too difficult for me, even. You know, the very fast passages, I, I slow it down if I need to. But Charlie Hayden solo was really a big challenge for me. Because I don't know anything about bass. Yeah. And the, there is a part where he plays uh, by chords, so two notes at a time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had to listen a million times. And the rhythm that he's, he's using is very loose. You know, with, uh, it was it was one of the most challenging, and it's not a difficult solo in terms of notes. You know, Charlie Hayden wasn't the kind of player that loved to play a trillion notes in a second, but the way he plays and the instrument and the tone, yeah, it was it was hard. Yeah. But I I asked a friend of mine, a bass player, and apparently I did a good job. Uh, but maybe the, my friend was trying to be nice to me. <laughs> uh, so the silly question now, um, which transcription you've done is your favorite? So this is the, des the desert island question, you know, you are sent on a desert island and you have only one transcription allowed to bring with you, which eventually will save your life. Uh, <laughs> I told you. That's, 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 uh, you know, I don't know if it's a desert island transcription, but the one that's so near and dear to my heart is probably the solo that I, the, the, the first solo that I really transcribed all the way through, which, uh, you know, again, a, a Michael Brecker solo, he brought up um, his solo on Confirmation. Yeah. Which is the, three quartets. The, yeah, yeah, it's like a good bonus track on there. The With bonus Chikorita. track. Yeah, on drums. <laughs> yeah. It's funny. But um, that solo just has so much great vocabulary. And I remember when I think I must have been like a, maybe in 10th grade or something when I transcribed that. And I just remember listening. That that was a solo I loved, you know, going going full circle here to what I was saying earlier. I, I listened to that and I was like, I have got to know what he is playing because everything about it, the phrasing, the notes, the rhythm is just hit me right in the sweet spot and uh it, that's that solo is just so so uh, dear to me that um yeah that's the juice now that's reasonable because uh <clears throat> i remember studying with dave liban and he's a great advocate of transcribing <clears throat> i remember him telling once that in a jazz musician life there are probably no more than two, three solos that will be the real core of your language and how your language developed, you know, in the future. So uh, most of the times is the first solos that we transcribe, even because they are the first. So it takes us more time and we struggle to get to the end because it's everything is new and we face new difficulties and so and i i, I get your answer and it's probably similar to me but uh yeah usually the first two three solos are still you know embedded oh my gosh it's just like language i mean we're it's, it's like we're at the beginning of learning the language we're super impressionable and yeah. you know when you're when you learn language when you're a child you know you end up sounding a lot like your parents because that's who you learn from that's your first experience to the language yeah so uh i think that that's a good point that's true uh so jeff 
thanks a lot again for being here i'm pretty sure the viewers will enjoy this episode and please check out uh, jeff website and jeff youtube channel uh, there is a lot of great content there and i had a lot of fun uh, spending this hour with you jeff thanks again thank you again for having me this was such a great conversation i really appreciate it and goodbye to everyone <laughs>